Well, good morning, everybody. I can actually hear you this way. That's kind of nice. Well, welcome to a uh, quite odd Sunday. If any of you feel the need to uh, understand more fully why we're meeting out here, just feel free to step inside the sanctuary for about 15 seconds and your question shall be answered. It is, I believe, 43, 44 degrees in there at the moment, something like that. So you're welcome to, but I'm going to be out here because it's warm. So. It is, it is a little nice and, and uh, a little cozy, cozy today, but I think that's fine. Now, as we are significantly closer to each other than normal, it is particularly important that you join with me in the holy act of silencing thy cell phones. So, uh, but if you could also join, and I don't, you may stand if you wish, but it is a little odd situation of spacing. But if you could join with me as well in the call to worship. Good morning. <laughs> the Lord is continually creating something new. We are all part of that vision, renewed, redeemed, and beloved. Through all this change, God is with us. Though we struggle and doubt, yet God is faithful. Praise be to God who continually blesses us. Let us, hearts, our voices, and our spirits sing God's praises. Amen. Please join in hymn 67, We Thy People Praise Thee. If you can join now in the prayer of invocation with me. Oh God, you offer us so much. Forgive us for sharing so little. You have called us to your ways. Forgive us for ignoring your call. You have given us the gift of family. Forgive us for not giving thanks. You have given us countless blessings. Forgive us for taking your love for granted. Teach us to love like you, forgive like you, serve like you. May we know the peace and joy you offer as we share it to a world in chaos. Amen. Love the sparrow of the rail.
first reading of scripture today comes from Genesis 2, 7 through 9, and 15 through 25 from the Women's Lectionary. Can you hear me okay? I just speak up a little more? All right. <laughs> the sovereign God crafted the human from the dust of the humus and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living soul. And the sovereign God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there placed the human whom God had formed. Out of the ground, the sovereign God made grow every tree pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life in the middle of the garden, along with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The sovereign God took the human and settled it in the garden of Eden to till and tend it. Then the sovereign God commanded the human from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Then the sovereign God said, it is not good that the human should be alone. I will make it someone to rely on as its partner. Then the sovereign God crafted from the humus every creature of the field and every bird of the skies and brought them to the human to see what it could call them. And whatever the human called every living soul, that was its name. The human gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the human, there was not found one to rely on as its partner. The sovereign God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and it slept, then took one of its sides and closed, it up, closed up its place with flesh in place of it. And the sovereign God built the side that had been taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human. Then the human said, this time, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called a woman, for out of a man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and his father and clings to his woman, and they become one flesh. And they were, the two of them, naked, the man and his woman, or the woman and her man, and were not ashamed. Thank you, Katie. I usually kind of like it like that. Anyway, anyway um, we do have a couple of announcements, nothing particularly um, un unusual. This is a uh, season of Lent, so there are uh, a number of things to look, to look towards. We will be having a Good Friday service this year. Uh, that'll be, you know, next month. But we will be having a, a Good Friday service, which will be in the fellowship hall and walking through kind of experiential stations of the cross and uh, ending in communion. Kind of similar to what we did a few years ago, but more things to do since we can touch things now uh, a little bit. Say well. I was going to say safer, but eh, that's a relative term. Anyway, there will be those options. Um, there's also going to be several uh, concerts that Christopher will be putting on during the season of Lent. That the exact uh, times and dates are going to be in here. Are in here. Uh, who's on third concert will be occurring because believe it or not, we're about to set foot into March. Uh, but we are whether I want to or not. So um, anyway, I believe that's about it. And this, this is not a permanent arrangement. We just legitimately, I spent 45 minutes trying to figure out how to restart the furnace and we couldn't figure it out and the tech can't get here until Monday. Okay, so uh, next time I'll write the instructions down, I promise. That's, that's the big lesson. It's, it's not going to stick up here. But uh, I believe, let us, as we prepare for, for uh, prayer, let's uh, take a moment and listen.
sure, why not? So the very first place that I ever ended up preaching at, I took a RV chapel for the summer, you know, where uh, it's a people come with their RVs in for the week, spend a couple of weeks, snowbirds going up and down, you know, migratory humans, right? <laughs> Love them. It's phenomenal. And it was the absolute perfect place to cut my teeth with preaching because you could completely and utterly mess up and it would be a completely and utterly new audience the next week. So nobody knew that you were horrible at this. It was utterly amazing. But it also taught me to not particularly list, take, take compliments with a grain of salt, okay? Because, yeah, 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 knows the story, I know. So it was like this, it was a long, narrow, and it was here, and it was about me and Penny was the first row. And the only person that was there every week was one gentleman who would come in, sit down about where Penny is, and fall asleep during the pastoral prayer. <laughs> he would sleep through the entire pastoral prayer, the entire sermon, and then without fail, I'd close in prayer, amen, his eyes would snap open, he'd hop out of his seat, stick his hand out and go, good sermon time. <laughs> So, Penny, I'm counting on you to make me feel at home, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, yeah, I... Oh, well. well, we do have some prayer requests uh, coming forward. Uh, we, we have uh, a number of people uh, for Norma Clark, a uh, friend of Leslie's, whose husband is on hospice, and for... Uh, for his comfort and his care, but for her strength as well as she is walking with her loved one through this time and coming to grips with what that means and what that will mean. Um, for her health as she needs to look after herself during this time as well, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. We also uh, want to lift up a very um, similar situation, but on the opposite of Wangaran's friend, Stephen, who's, um, he's been his wife's caregiver and he now has cancer. So for swift diagnoses, for treatments that work, for help with his wife, with planning, with being able to look after not just his loved one but himself for wisdom and how to balance all of that because that is not an easy load or an easy journey. Say, Lord, yeah. hear our prayers. Um, Naomi has a friend, Maureen, who also has a bladder, also has cancer, diagnosed with bladder cancer. And... Um, for swift healing for her and good surgery and treatment. We also say, Lord, hear our prayers. Um, Judy has brought up a whole cluster of prayer requests. She was hoping to be here today. But um, for she is part of a, a group of ladies at the swim, at the, the aquatic center, that they have a number of prayer requests uh, in the circle for them and for loved ones, for healing for, for all of them, for comfort that they will be a support to each other and for Judy to be able to be a support to them, to be a comfort, to be able to be Christ's love and Christ's arms for people who truly need it. Say, so, Lord, there are prayers. Um, I would praise that, I mean, Naomi has been missing about a fourth of work just due to her hip. She has a early onset arthritis in, in her hips. And so, yep, that's the appropriate noises. And um, she's been doing well enough. She's been able to actually get to work the last week. So, and walk without extreme pain. So for praises, for simple things like walking, we do say thank you, God. Now, um, we, uh, Penny's family is uh, having a rough time of it in a whole variety of different ways. And 
for her children and grandchildren, the in-laws, the outlaws, the step-laws, and everybody in between. That they will have wisdom, they will have health, they will have comfort and guidance. Say, Lord, hear our prayer. Now, anybody? Yep. He, Jim goes in uh, Wednesday morning for an ultrasound uh, to find out uh, if there's anything wrong with his kidney, along with everything else. You know. Okay. All right. So, for prayers that the ultrasound is accurate, that the doctors interpret it correctly, and that there's nothing wrong with the kidneys. We say, <laughs> we say, Lord, hear our prayers. You, I love you, brother, but you've got enough going on. You don't need any more. That's for sure. Um, okay. I have a praise. I, I meant last week to ask for prayers for my cousin Jenny, who doctor thought that she had metastasized uterine cancer. She went under uh, surgery Saturday, yesterday, no, Thursday. And um, several hours, turns out all of the tumors are benign. So she oh. completely misdirected me, but they, they were expecting to have to do more extensive surgery. So, oh, that is wonderful, though. So, big praises. Yes. For, for benign tumors and a renewed hope of life from ter terminal diagnosis to, no, it's all right. Never mind. Yeah, that's, oh, Whew. We definitely do say thank you, God. Um, Bill's daughter and her husband, her son and grandson all have COVID. Oh. They've all had shots. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bill's daughter's family with COVID. Um, well, hopefully that means it'll be a lot shorter. But uh, for patients with each other as they're cooped up together, <laughs> I think mean, that's that's a big one. A big one for us. For grace with each other, for swift healing, for good spirits during it that it will not spread to anyone else. Say, Lord, hear our prayers. Yes. Penny. My friend's grandson, Ryan, is in deep depression and um, is not knowing, having a hard time with life. And, uh, and his brother um, died of an overdose and not this reason. Okay. Um, Ryan dealing with depression and loss of a of a brother. Yeah. Um, that there will be people who will be able to reach him in the pit that he f finds himself in. That he will hang on through it for him to be able to see better days. So they often are there, but whether we can see them or not is a different issue. For healing, for the after the loss of his brother, you say, Lord, hear our prayers. Then let's take a few moments then in silent prayer, and I'll close us out in just a moment. Lord, 
You offer peace, and yet it is hard to tell sometimes even what that looks like in the midst of the chaos that we live in. In the midst of wars, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of pressure and stress that seem to squeeze every ounce of peace out of us possible. We seek your peace. Help us to be peacemakers in how we vote, in how we act, in how we serve, in how we talk, in how we forgive with our family, with our friends, with our enemies, with our strangers that we meet at the store. Let us find your peace in our everyday lives, your joy in even our everyday struggles, your love in the interactions with each person that we meet, and help us to be part of the reason why those that we interact with can also feel your love and your joy and your peace. As we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the New Testament comes from Colossians 3, 1 through 11. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed, when you were living that life. But now, you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself, yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is in all and in all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had such a lovely PowerPoint for today, too. <laughs> Just pretend.
Well, I, I like to cook. Some of you know this. Particularly, I enjoy baking. I am not saying that I am good at it. I simply say that I enjoy it. You do not have to be good at something that you enjoy. You can enjoy something you are terrible at. Like, it's a very American idea that you have to be good at things that you like. No, horrible at it. Still enjoy it. Because I like that, especially baking, because I like that if I follow the recipe precisely enough, then I get the precise result. Right? Because the rest of my life doesn't work that way. <laughs> and it frustrates me. So I like that there's one area that if I do these steps well, I know what I get. <laughs> of course, not all recipes are alike though, right? I mean, some cookbooks and websites are just loaded with bad ideas. Old cookbooks are some of my favorite things because they have some of the most dated recipes and horrific ideas I have ever seen. I was looking for waffles, waffle ideas the other day, right? And I stumbled across an old recipe from the 60s. Hard to mess up waffles, right? Pretty simple. <laughs> It instructed you to take a can of mushroom soup, strike one, a can of stuffed olives, oh, strike two, and a can of tuna, you're out of here, heat it up and pour it over your waffles. <laughs> That's not a waffle dish! That is a monstrosity coasting along on the good name of waffle, and waffle should sue it for libel. Like that, you'd have a good case on that, too. That's not a waffle dish! Some of you are turning down your hearing aids. I get that. <laughs> Or the burgers, the burgers that are all the rage in some circles that are like over a foot thick. They're still this big around, but they look like the leaning tower of cholesterol, right? They're piled with ham and eggs and potatoes and sauerkraut. S macaroni and cheese shows up on some hamburgers. Cheetos is now a big thing to put on hamburgers. Cheetos! Basically anything they can cram on there to the point where you can't even tell if there's actually a patty somewhere in this mess or not. And I certainly would not identify any of that as a burger. It looks more like the tragic result of a Safeway truck crashing on the highway and everyone just grabbing whatever they could out of the debris. More is not always better. Sometimes more ends up hiding what actually matters, what makes the dish special. And you can't just take away random things either, like crustless pizza. No, it's a cheesy casserole. It's not a crustless pizza. It's not the same. Of course, there are also insane ways that people supposedly elevate a dish through unique ingredients. I looked up coastal seafood recipes recently. Simple, local, coastal seafood. Can't mess that up. The only ingredient I owned was gold leaf. <laughs> Everything else was smoked sea urchin, sturgeon caviar, grated truffle, and spices I have never heard of in my life, and I'm pretty sure they made up. <laughs> Does piling on expensive ingredients without any reason or rhyme actually help? I mean, I can't imagine that that little $500 bowl of urchin guts actually tasted any better than smoked salmon or good clam chowder. Mm. Now I'm hungry. No. <laughs> I had a picture to show you. 
if we were in the sanctuary, of a full-size turkey that some cooking site had encased completely in gold foil and was trying to say that this was the best way to cook turkey for Thanksgiving. No, it's not. I mean, no, it's not. Objectively, it's not. And I mean fully. Fully. Like it. A recipe to be successful needs to allow what makes that dish special to shine, right? And that usually means more simplicity rather than less. A good roast does not need a thousand ingredients, right? It needs maybe a little salt to spike the natural flavor. Maybe, maybe some mushrooms to soak in the beef broth and help it retain some moisture, right? Maybe a few herbs to accent it to help make the star of the dish shine even brighter. Things that don't overshadow it or replace it but lift it up. Yet every good, for every good recipe I find, it seems that there are a dozen that are just terrible. Like, for those who were around during the 50s and 60s, why didn't you stick everything in jello? <laughs> Carrots and jello's not bad, but broccoli and ham? Why did you stick ham in jello? Those recipe books are crazy. <laughs> the, the Thanksgiving dinner complete with peas and stuffing and mashed potatoes and turkey in jello. Really? What? What evil is this? But then you also get bizarrely unnecessary ones, like gold-leafed turkeys, right? That you're like, oh yeah, there was a need for that. Or you get ones that try to add so much stuff that it drowns out what actually made you like the dish in the first place, like the foot-high hamburgers that nobody could eat to save their lives and would probably kill you if you tried it. In religion, you were wondering when I'd actually get through the analogy, weren't you? <laughs> I know, it's legitimately half the sermon this week. Ah, uh, I hope it's worth it. But in religion, we do very similar things because we pile a bunch of junk onto our faith until it's legitimately hard to tell what was supposed to be underneath it in the first place. Is organ music required for Christianity? Is drums? Is being white? Is being American? All of these things are expectations that get piled onto it sometimes that have really no business being there. We also have some old-timey recipes that just don't seem to fit modern tastes, like bashing babies' heads in with glee. Is it part of my worship routine and I don't want it to be, but somehow it's in the Psalms. Whoops. We even add bizarre things to our faith and claim they're essential to be authentic just so we can turn people away because they can't deal with it. Like how racism and sexism and homophobia have so often claimed to be necessary for authentic Christianity that they get added in just so that we can turn people away and be proud of it. Things like that have not just ruined the recipe, they have given spiritual food poisoning to millions and it's no wonder that they've got an adverse reaction. Naomi still can't have ham after I accidentally poisoned her with it about 18 years ago. <sighs> Specifically in mac and cheese. Like if you ever add ham to mac and cheese, Naomi will like leave the building. It's remarkable. Because sometimes the adverse reaction that we had, the effect that we had from these additives, these bad ingredients, all this stuff that gets thrown in there is so bad, it poisons our reception of that forever. Which is exactly why we're looking at Genesis 2. The story of the creation of humanity. Because if there has been a more misused and misunderstood passage of scripture, I am not sure what it is off the top of my head. 
This passage has been used to create the most absurd pseudo-scientific idiocy imaginable. And it gets and all of that somehow gets piled onto our faith as if this steaming pile of insanity is somehow essential. It's it's not. It's really not. It has also been used as the essential proof as to why women should be subservient and lesser. A crown jewel of sexism that has no business being in the recipe at all. So let's take a look, since I've primed the well so well for that. First, remember that Hebrew is a gendered language. And it's a language that has few words and a lot of multiple why. The definitions of words in Hebrew are very broad. They encompass a lot of concepts and a lot of words in English. Because if you have every root of a word having to only be three, three letters, that will do it. I'm so proud of me I got that right. It only took two tries. Two to three. <laughs> But Hebrew is also a gendered language, with every chair, every twig being male or female by necessity of language rather than an actual gender attached to the object. Right? The passage we've read in today tells how God spoke. And God's breath, air, spirit, life, essence, all the same word, all the same concept, went out. Because that's what happens when you speak. Is wind comes out. Breath comes out. This, this spirit, same word, translated differently, went out to shape and form creation. And while walking on the ground of this creation, the Adama. The soil, the Adama in Hebrew. God created something new. God gathered the Adama and spoke again. That same breath, that same spirit, shaping the Adama into something new, into an Adam. A human. From the Adama came the Adam. From the soil came the person. No gender is implied at this point beyond what is required by the language. It is an Adam, a little dirt ball with God's spirit in it. And if I have ever heard of a succinct definition of humanity, a little dirt ball with some of God's spirit in it, eh, it's pretty good, actually. That's not bad. That's not bad. They might say scum, but you know, dirt works too. <laughs> Depends on my mood and the person, but I'm working on it. But God had built this Adam for companionship, and no one could be found. So God took one side, one half of the Adam, and made a new one, a different Adam. And here for the first time, once God takes Fortunately, the very first anesthesia recorded because he puts the Adam to sleep and then rips them in half. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I'm sure they did too. And from that, now for the first time, gender in, enters into it because new words show up. We have Ish and Isha. We have man and we have woman. An entire side of the human pulled off Half of it pulled into male and half female. We grew up reading it as ribs. So if you're wondering where the ribs went, right? Well, you took a rib from the man and then you grew it. And look, and yes, it's because the, the women are small, just a fraction of the man. It's not in the text. It's nowhere in there. It has never been in there. Not ever. It's not a thing. It's side. Okay? But the reason why we grew up reading it as ribs, the reason why we grew up hearing it told that women are just a small part of a man, is not because it's in the text, hear me clearly, but because sexist men have been left alone to translate the Bible for hundreds of years. Okay? That's it. Some total. Some total of reasons. That's it. 
nothing else. There's no grammatical reason for it. There's no lexicographical reason for it. There's no theological reason for it. There's no textual reason. There is nothing except rampant sexism by the translators. It's not there. An Adam, a person, two people. Hey, check it out. They're, it's like they're meant for each other because they came from each other. And we've known that this like rib thing wasn't the point. Because this story is also where we get the concept of our other half that we talk about. We know it's a half. We know it. We talk about that all the time, which granted, there is no theological or biblical basis for that either. But that's a different issue. But this creation story was never meant to provide a basis of subjugating anyone. It's not in there. Period. We've piled that on like mac and cheese poured over a burger. Or probably more accurately like uh, tuna fish and uh, a little bit of uh, 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 olives and uh, mushroom soup poured over some delicious waffles. Mmm. Doesn't everybody love that? No, I'm no longer hungry. It's a miracle. <laughs> Who knew? Rather, the recipe for a human that this passage was meant to tell is one of interconnectedness. It tells how we are made of three things. We are made of the Adama. We are made of the dust. We are connected to the world that we walk on because we are made from it. We are part of it. We are made of God's spirit. That we are connected and empowered by the ultimate creator to create. And we are made of each other. We are connected to one another. We are part of one another. And even in death, we retain those connections. We continue on in the hearts and minds of the people that we were connected with here on earth. We return to the dust and our spirit returns to be with God. Where it came from. That's the recipe. That is the basic recipe of human. Connection. It is literally built into our creation. It is told in the creation story. It is the foundational idea of what it means to be human. is to be connected with God, connected with this world, and connected with one another. We are tied to it all. The trick, like a good recipe, is balancing all three of those ingredients so that they shine without overpowering one or another. And we have really messed up such a simple recipe. We have piled all sorts of stuff on top of that. Fortunately, one of the most powerful things that Jesus does is to show us what the recipe is supposed to look like for human if we use good ingredients in the right ratios. He is the recipe of human. Like the picture of this recipe applied that we see in magazines. Like, oh, human. That looks delicious. <laughs> That's poor wording. Good thing it's not Communion Sunday. But humans, Adams, were meant to be like Jesus. That is the recipe. So Paul recognizes this as well. In Colossians, he reminds his readers of the connection that they still have with Christ through God. And reminds his, his readers of all the unnecessary ingredients that they are trying to keep adding to the recipe. And he says, simplify it. Cut out the things that, don't, that you don't see in Jesus, but you do see in you. Cut out the greed. Cut out the rage. Cut out the slander. Cut out the lying. Cut out the abusive language. So that the recipe, so that we can re be renewed to look more like the image of the original recipe. So that we can look more like our creator. So often we focus on what separates us from each other, and both in the good and in the negative, right? We focus on um, 
Because there, there's a lot that can be different. A pumpkin pie can change radically if you add an eighth of a teaspoon of cloves or not, right? Like radically change. But you can still have a good pumpkin pie with or without cloves. It just changes. The root of the recipe is still there and it's still being elevated. Sometimes we focus on whether you should add sauerkraut to pumpkin pie, and the answer is no. We will draw the line firmly. <laughs> Methodist is a big tent church, but I draw the line at no. Uh, not really. But we can also focus on whether we have cloves or not. And the little tiny details that are still good, but they add up, they make us unique. That's fine. But it's never supposed to be what defines us. It isn't what makes up our recipe. Those little differences aren't what makes us human. It isn't what makes us valuable. It isn't where we draw life from. Our defining characteristic from the first moment that a human showed up is connection with God, with the earth, with each other. That's it. This Lent, let's take a look at simplifying our recipe so that those three things get amplified get elevated rather than buried under a mound of stuff that isn't necessary, even if it claims to be gold leaf and caviar. <laughs> Let's join in page 718. The Lord becomes the God of the
Well, if you can take this blessing with you as you go today. May you know the recipe of Jesus. May you see what God wants from you. May you simplify your life down to where you are relishing and lifting up the connections that God has placed around you. May you cherish each one. Go in peace. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday. Maybe in there. Thank <laughs> you.